Welcome to How Ecology Works. In this podcast, we cover all topics in ecology and how you might apply them in your future career. Hey, everybody. So today I'm talking with Kevin Robertson. And Kevin, uh, you've been working with, with plant ecology and fire ecology for a long time. And I wanted you to tell us a little bit about what you think is important when you're thinking about vegetative succession and how that relates to fire ecology and vice versa. I know they they, uh, feed back on one another, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on that topic area. Yeah, it's an interesting topic. You know, succession has been one of the foundational concepts in ecology from the beginning. Some people even think that was the first real ecological concept. And um, the original envisioning of the way succession worked, and you're probably familiar with this if you've taken any ecology class or anything, is that there's a disturbance, and that disturbance is assumed to eliminate vegetation and create what's sometimes called a blank state. And then that blank area where the vegetation's been eliminated by this disturbance gets filled by certain kinds of species called pioneer species or early successional species. So those are species, you're, you're basically, when you say blank state, you mean there are no plants present and everything that colonizes comes from somewhere outside of that blank state? That's exactly right. So some examples might be a, a, a point bar on a meandering river or a, a lava flow or, or maybe where like a, a tree tipped up and you've got exposed soil. Or if you're including uh, human disturbances, it could be a disc field where it's just nothing there but dirt pretty much. And so those are examples of, of, of blank states where you're starting from scratch. And so you have to have something to fill it back in. And different plants have different life history characteristics. And certain species, and we might consider them weedy species, rural species, early successional species, are really good at getting into, into places uh, pretty quickly that have been highly disturbed. So they're these colonizing the kind of, these blank states. They're good at colonizing these blank states. One thing before you you uh, continue on, the blank state, is that also what we would call primary succession, like the beginning of primary succession? It, yeah, some of the, uh, the, the differences between primary and secondary succession can be a little bit fuzzy. Um, but yeah, on a small scale, you would consider that to be primary succession. Now, it could be a very small space, so this kind of thing could happen on a pocket gopher burrow where there's some dirt piled up by the, by the gopher or, or a gopher tortoise skirt where they've, or, or like a tree tip up, like, like I mentioned. So I think, and in, 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 in this is the point I was going to get to, is uh, nat- in natural ecosystems, these blank states, in natural pine savannas in the southeast at least, and, and probably ecosystems in general, these blank states tend to be pretty small and pretty limited. And that's one area in which I think the early conceptualization of of ecology and uh, and succession probably got it wrong, which is they they seem to think that there are kinds of disturbances that created blank states over very large areas. Yeah, like you were talking about with the island island formation or something from a... Yeah, something like that. But in fact, it's pretty rare. Um, for and usually these these blank states where succession gets started again are, are, are small patches within a larger ecosystem. So even lava flows. You know, they, they tend to be street, streaks going down a mountain where you've got, you know, areas where the surrounding vegetation can have its pioneer species recolonize that area. Or in longleaf pine savannas, it might be an area where uh, a tree falls over and you get severe um, sterilization of the soil because of long fire duration of the crown of that plant. Or, or like I said, a, a tree tip up or a gopher tortoise burrow or a point bar in a meandering river. These are all relatively small areas on the larger landscape. Yeah, So, and like a human disturbance, we we had another episode on the same segment that was talking about uh, where we reclaiming mines. So that would be another example where our activities have actually created this blank state and there may not, you know, the plants from surrounding communities or we have to bring in plants to colonize those areas. Yeah, and I think actually some of the bias in thinking about how important these blank states are probably comes from looking at human disturbances. Because one of the earliest uh, situations that ecologists started to study was old field succession, where somebody had actually taken a disc plow or you know horse and a plow and plowed up a large area, and then we're looking at what happens in that area over time when you stop that disturbance. But again, a field is kind of an unnaturally large disturbance compared to what you would usually see in nature. And I think there was an assumption that fire, for example, created blank slates. They would, would create a whole landscape or something where, where everything was dead. And so vegetation needed to come in from the outside. 
Or hurricanes are another example. They thought, oh, hurricanes are a devastating disturbance and it kills everything and has to come back. But over time, you know, empirical ecology, when they started to look at these things, they realized, ah, that's not really true. And, and even pretty severe wildfires are tend to leave behind a pretty, a pretty large seed bank. A, a lot of the, the plants um, re-sprout. And, uh, you know, these blank slates might be more common under, under unnatural conditions of fire, like wildfire, where you have an unnatural amount of fuel accumulate that does kill a lot of the vegetation, whereas historically you had more frequent fire regimes where things would just get top-killed and re-sprout. And so fire wasn't acting in, a dis in the same way that the conceptualization of succession considered it to. And that's one, one of the main points I wanted to make here is that uh, fire oftentimes does not, just because a fire occurs doesn't mean it created a blank slate. And a lot of times, in fact, it... Um, like we were talking about earlier, it's like mowing the grass, where you just take the take the top off the vegetation. It's perennial vegetation. In longleaf pine savannas, about 99 point something percent of the species are perennial species that re-sprout when they're burned. Yeah, um, so I really like that analogy with the mowing the grass. I mean, most of us are familiar with, with continuously mowing grass, and every time you mow it, you're not killing the grass, and new grass has to colonize. You're, you're talking about the same sort of thing with fire. A lot of the plants, like in the longleaf community, when 99% of them are perennial, they actually have a, a, a adaptation that is itself an adaptation to be to withstand being top killed by fire, and the actual individual plant re-sprouts from the same root system. It's not new plants colonizing per se. It, when uh, when fires happen in most cases. That's exactly right. So in these frequent fire-dependent systems like grasslands and, and savannas, which cover a lot of the world, it's only 20 or 30 percent of the of the world historically, um, fire is really a, a force that maintains the system instead of setting it back to an earlier stage of succession. Now here's where things get a little bit complicated, where oftentimes, according to the earlier conceptualization of succession, Succession occurs in the in the absence of fire. Okay, so the, the the community starts to change into what they would call a climax community, which was considered to be the uh, the very stable, long lived um, community. So this worked in models like beech magnolia forests or something where the where the climax was consisted of, of tree species that lived three hundred years old and they were very resilient to small disturbances. But then a big disturbance would knock it all back to an early successional state, and it would take a long time to develop again. But as, as early as the 1930s, even when these other kind of traditional concepts of succession were being developed, there are people like uh, like Herbert uh, Chapman, Herbert Hop Chapman, who considered the longleaf pine savanna maintained by frequent fire to be a climax community, or to be more like a climax community than an earlier succession community. So in a sense, fire in that is a stabilizing factor in that community, and the disturbance would be removing it. it sounds like is what. what well, you're saying. certainly that fire would be a would be a, a, a sustaining a, a force that was sustaining the climax community that he was arguing. Now to say that taking out the fires, the disturbance runs into some problem with ecological terms, and that disturbances are usually thought of as something that's kind of punctuated, you know, something that happens. But I think the right way to think about fire is not to think of fire as a disturbance, but to pose the question of whether or not fire causes a disturbance uh, according to whatever your definition of disturbance is. So according to the traditional definition of in, in the context of succession, where a disturbance has to be something that destroys, kills the vegetation completely and creates a blank slate, oftentimes fire does not do that. However, it can do that in certain circumstances. Like I mentioned, if the crown of a tree falls on the ground or if you've got like a a log on the ground that burns for a long time and sterilizes the soil, that really is a blank slate. Or if you're in a, a place where fire hasn't occurred in a long time and you build up enough fuel that the, exactly. the fire is catastrophic, or you that's the way we would think about it, Yeah, and you you burn 20 foot of duff, that might be one of, one of these, these uh, punctuated disturbances that you're talking about that remove all plant material. Yeah, and in that context, I think that succession still does happen in these longleaf pine, for example, you know, savannas, where the, the, the matrix or the predominant area is dominated by really later successional species. They're long-lived, they're perennial, they're stable, they don't reproduce very often. You know, wiregrass is kind of like a the, probably one of the best examples of this kind of species. It's really good at hunkering down and re-sprouting after fire, 
but it's not very rural. It's not very early successional or pioneer in the sense of getting into new spaces where there's these blank slates. So if you disc up an area, it doesn't come back for years and years. A lot of so time. If, you, if there is an event that removes it, it's not very good at recolonizing, but it's really good at persisting through recurring front fires. That's exactly right. But there are still uh, native, early successional, rural species that are part of these, uh, part of the repertoire of these communities. So that uh, obviously it, there are these blank slate creating disturbances within the larger matrix that they have to be recovered over time. And I think they are. And I think they actually follow a, a progression of succession that matches pretty well with the um, conventional concepts of beginning with early successional species and then eventually being replaced by later successional species and the soil develops back again and comes back to being like it was before. It, it sounds like having those, even though they're small scale, those events are still pretty important because there are other plants in the community that, that are, I guess, well adapted to, to colonize the blank slate. So even though they may not be the entire, the entirety of the plant community, they are an important part of that community succession in terms of diversity in that community that's very true and um they add a lot to the to the diversity they tend to be in the seed bank a lot of times too so when you get a soil disturbance like a burrowing animal or something then then things like you know yankee weed and uh, dog fennel or kind of classic early successional species they pop up and the, the seeds are they persist in the seed bank for a long time and and some of those seeds i think are even uh they they are uh, light activated right where the soil is actually churned and and the exposure to the new light conditions That's right. uh, causes their germination. And a lot of them are dispersed by seed very easily. Now, I guess trying to get to a little bit earlier is, is that to make the things a little more complicated, a lot of people think of succession in a fire-dependent community like a longleaf pine savanna is what happens when you stop burning and it starts to change to a different ecosystem type. And that's certainly true if you stop burning it then all the woody plants, especially that would have been top killed by that frequent fire, turn into big trees and they cast lots of shade. And then, you know, some large percentage, 80 or 90 percent of the other species start to disappear because of shade and not having that fire maintain that system anymore. But whether that's succession in sort of the traditional sense uh, is kind of doubtful. It's really more like uh, what you might call an alternate stable state, some people call it, or really just one ecosystem changing to another because you've changed some of the fundamental ecosystem processes that should have maintained that system. So I, I'm not as comfortable with calling that succession in the traditional sense as much as just a, um, just a phase change from one ecosystem type to another because you've, you've tweaked the, uh, the forces that are, that are maintaining the system. Because there are, even in the southeastern landscape, it's famous for having a lot of fire, but there are ecosystem types that are fire-free or very fire-infrequent. And they're there because there's little or no fire. So the beech magnolia, you know, holly spruce pine types of uh, forest primeval is, a, is an example of that. And there's some evidence that if you stop burning in a pine savanna, it will ultimately, over a long period of time, turn into that. But it's not part of, a, of what I would think of as a natural cycle in the sense of, of succession. If there being a disturbance, then it turns into a climax and then goes back. But it's something that might happen over, you know, kind of like, almost geologic cycles or something like that. And they have a lot to do with landscape context more than they do some kind of a, a cycle in, in a particular location. You know, those, those, those types of ecosystems that don't have fire in them tend to occur on the east sides of rivers where there's a, where there's a natural fire shadow from prevailing west wind, you know, west winds pushing fires or, or where there's a lot of streams that would act as natural fire breaks. So it's kind of a different situation. Well, that was really interesting. I, I appreciate you going in depth on on the top of this topic. It, I think it was really useful for all of us to to uh, learn about how succession works and how disturbances like fire are integrated within that that framework. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. I appreciate the opportunity.